Okay, so last week, uh, if you weren't here, we looked at anger and how we can take unrighteous anger and have that transformed into righteous anger. And there's something I just want to uh, uh, acknowledge. In my 20 plus years of preaching ministry, I have never had as significant a response from men to a message in my life. Uh, Most Sundays, I hear from ladies thanking me, acknowledging the message, etc. I don't often hear from men. I exclusively heard from men last week. And, and not just thanks for that, but acknowledgement of the journey of anger. I, I saw action and fruit, people trying to go forward differently. And so I was just really encouraged by what God seemingly did amongst us. I wasn't expecting that, but it was so encouraging. So God bless those of you that felt challenged by that. And I do just continue to pray that his spirit would be at work in you transforming those, uh, those things in us that we sometimes wish were different. Today we're going to look at fear. And I want to begin this message by participating in um, this same sort of spirit of vulnerability that so many men shared last week. Uh, so fear, I've, I've wrestled with fear more than any emotion in my life. Uh, I think that it would be fair to classify me, at least previously, as a fearful person. Uh, I have memories of specific moments in my life where I became afraid of something and it changed me. Uh, It wasn't just temporary, it wasn't just for a moment that something in me changed through that experience of fear. That fear sort of latched on, put its hooks in me, and caused me to go from being afraid to an afraid person or a fearful person. Uh, So the pandemic was especially revealing of that for me. Um, I say often that Yes, crisis builds character, but crisis reveals character. And the crisis of that pandemic was one that I went, wow, like I am, I am in a prison of fear, ultimately. And it all kind of compounded into an awareness and admission in about spring of, I think, 2022, if my math is right. And I started to get some help. And working through that, one of the, one of the best things that happened was I started to recognize myself. And there was like the same joy that you feel when you reunite with like an old friend was what it felt like, but in regards to my own self. And I went, oh, I remember him. I remember when he used to laugh easy. I remember when things used to not bother him so much. And it was, it was really an incredible experience. And God had been so faithful and he'd walked me through this. But I want to shout out one uh, other uh, couple here because I just think that this is important. I want to give a, a special shout out to Dr. Brian Austin and Becky. Why I say that is because they are the owner-operators of Satana, which is just just down the road over here. And uh, it is this incredible wellness center where you can do everything from like float in like the Dead Sea, sort of, uh, but your own Dead Sea, to like various light therapies and of course counseling and just lots of different programs. And one of the programs they offer is uh, something called neurofeedback, where they actually can look at like your brain and your brain waves and start to send little tiny signals to help your brain begin to like repair itself from things like trauma or fear or stress or whatever it might be. And so Brian, very graciously, or because I was a bit of an experiment for him, he hasn't admitted officially yet, but took me through I think 11 sessions of doing that with me repeatedly just because he cared about me. And that became the sort of foundation of me on this journey back to kind of getting my life together and and, uh, becoming more whole again. So I'll forever be grateful to them. I remember Becky standing in my office saying, you should go talk to Brian about this. He's looking for people to, you know, test it on. (laughs) Sure. Um, and I just say, too, if you're struggling with your own mel- mental wellness, check them out. Uh, they've got lots of great things for various needs. And uh, Brian and Beck here, Christians, they're part of our church. We want their business to prosper. We want it to do well. And so go check them out. Uh, so that's a little bit of my story. And yet it's not an uncommon one. The best things about stories are when we hear our own story and other people's stories. 
that's when stories come to life for us. And so fear as a experience, but also as a dysfunction, is something that is common in all of us at one time or another. Uh, we talk about fear a lot. We talk about anxiety a lot. Uh, ang anxiousness or anxiety has even become like a status symbol or an identity in our culture today. Uh, I, my heart breaks for Gen Z where being known as anxious or traumatized is, is a way to identify and have a unique thing. Um, and that's not to, to take away from the severity of trauma and real anxiety, but that's a way to be known for something today. Now, fear and anxiety is interesting because it's something that can both be taught and something that is just in us. Uh, if you grew up in a home where fear was talked about or, or something specific uh, was talked about as something to be very afraid of, you probably grew up going, I'm afraid of that. And maybe even today you're still like, ooh, I don't know about that. But it's also true that before fear is ever taught to us at a certain age, we just become afraid. And so a baby becomes afraid of their dad when their dad shaves his beard for the first time. The baby looks at them and cries, where a week before they may not have had that response. Or a little bit later, babies start to become afraid when their mom isn't around, where two months before that, they wouldn't have really noticed other than when they get hungry and dad can't feed them. And then eventually the dark becomes scary. You know, children become aware of themselves, their own bodies, the way they look. They become insecure for different reasons. And fear becomes something that is just sort of in us. No one taught us to be afraid of our dad when he shaves, but there it is. And in some instances, that, that fear response is a good thing because it tells us that something is not right, that danger is present, that there's risk and possibly with big consequence. But like so many other emotions, there is a dark side to fear. And that's a, a side we're all familiar with. I can go from being a trusted friend that sends off warning signals and alerts us to danger to being a bullying enemy all in the same day. And of course, the Bible has a lot to say about fear. Uh, far, more, far more than I could ever cover in a sermon, uh, even within a series, I could not cover this topic. Uh, there is no command used more in the Bible than do not fear, do not be afraid, which would suggest humans tend to struggle with this, but it's also that God is aware. And so today we are going to just touch like the surface of fear. And I want to try to define it a little bit. I want to tr try to help you maybe I guess, ask some discerning questions in your own life if this is something that, like me, has sort of put you in a prison. And then I want to give you a very specific strategy, not all the strategies, a specific strategy, one way that you can engage fear in a way that becomes uh, a tool rather than a traitor in your life, you could say. Uh, I want to just acknowledge this book real quick. I've mentioned it. It's called The Cry of the Soul, How Our Emotions Reveal Our Deepest Questions About God by Dan Lender and Tremper Longman, uh, forward by Joni Erickson Tata, which is a great forward. Um, I will borrow heavily from this book. I think I only use one quote today that isn't from this book. Uh, if you are, are processing emotions and you want a, a Christian way to look at them, this is about as good a book as I found on the topic. All right. Um, so let's define fear. I mean, like one definition of fear. There's probably millions. Fear is our response to uncertainty about our resources in the face of danger. We could probably stop there and just, that's pretty good. Our response to uncertainty about our resources in the face of danger. When we are assaulted by a force that overwhelms us and compels us, to face that we are helpless and out of control. Fear is provoked when the threat of danger, physical or relational, exposes our inability to preserve what we most deeply cherish. So there's a, a, a pretty good definition of fear. A lot of that you'll see is to do with our own control and tension of of can I take care of this? If I can take care of this, then I'm not afraid. If I don't feel like I can take care of this, fear shows up. So how does fear behave? And of course, this is going to be different from person to person, but generally speaking, broadly speaking, fear behaves by initiating a flight 
response within us. Uh, Psalm 55, David writes these words so long ago. I don't have a slide for this story, but David says, Fear and trembling, fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. And I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and storm. And so writing thousands of years ago, David is saying, when I'm afraid, I wish I was a bird that I could take flight. So anger responds to a threat with a fight response, this is what we talked about last week. When we are angry, we engage, we go after it, we try to destroy the threat. Fear does the opposite. It cringes before the perceived threat, and then it flies. It gets out of there. It concludes that there is insufficient personal ability or resource to deal with the threat. Therefore, the best option I have is to run away. So that's generally how fear behaves. And then the big question is, well, what are we afraid of? Is there commonality in our fear? Of course, there's going to be uniquenesses to all of us, but is there anything specifically that we share in common that makes us afraid? And of course there is. The big one is death. Our greatest common fear is death. This was our grandparents' fear. This was their grandparents' fear and their grandparents' fear. Every generation has wrestled with the fear of death. If you think about your life, decisions mostly revolve around avoiding death. We wear helmets and we have seatbelts. We have laws and we have food preparation guidelines and we go to the doctor and we buy the right winter coat and we have vitamins and we should exercise and the list goes on and on because we're trying to not die. And we're trying to mostly ensure that those we love also don't die. And so we give our children rules and we put helmets on their heads and put them in super duper seatbelts and all these things to make sure that the thing we cherish the most is safe. You remember all it took to shut the world down was to tell us all that we were immediately under the threat of death by way of virus. And then we all locked our doors and remember the word, we sheltered in place. Same word David uses. I wish I could go and shelter. We were told if we could just shelter, we wouldn't die. And fearful humanity went, yeah, I'm up for that. Shelter in place. Sounds good. Never said it before, but I'll do it now. Notably, importantly, as Christians, death and the fear of death are so deep within the human being that Jesus' ministry focused on death. And the fear of it. So one of my favorite verses in the New Testament explaining the work of Jesus. This is Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. It says, since the children have flesh and blood, he, that's Jesus, too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. The human fears physical death so much that relieving people from that fear, the fear of death, like we can talk about that he gave us eternal life and he conquered death, but just relieving the fear of death is one of the great benefits of the victory of Jesus Christ. Jesus gave eternal life. Yes, he did, but he also delivered people from the slavery of the fear of death today. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Uh, in addition to physical death, we fear other forms of death. We fear breaking down. We fear not being ourselves. We fear aging. We fear change. The season dying, so to speak. We fear our children moving away. We fear our traditions being lost. We don't want our lives in any way to dissolve, fragment, or come apart. We don't want death in any form, relationally, emotionally, physically. Death, then, is our great fear. It's our great adversary. And a second fear that certainly has left its impact on each of us and is related to the fear of death is helplessness. Uh, it's pretty common knowledge that people today, all of us struggle with the desperation to control. 
to have control of our lives, to have control of others, to keep our environment the way we want it. And therefore, the more helpless we feel to deal with the perceived threat, the greater our fear. The less we feel like we have control over the situation, the greater our fear becomes. Uh, determining, oh boy, I think I'm helpless here, is often when that flight response is triggered. And we go, I got to get out of here. We'll hang in there and we'll be very courageous as long as we feel we can handle the threat through our own wisdom, ability, means, strength, whatever it might be. But if it's too strong, run. And that's actually part of why we are so drawn into busyness and hurried lives and work addicted lives because those are all places where we can pretend that we have more power and control than we really do. And we can accomplish and we can go, oh no, look, I was in charge and I just ordered this to happen and look, it happened. But we also know that as quickly as we see things take place at work or in our lives that we controlled and implemented, they come apart very quickly. I was talking to Pastor Brianne this week and she was lamenting that she can spend hours and hours and hours washing her walls to get the handprints of children off of them. And then they'll come in from outside. And all of the hours of work in just a moment is erased with handprints marking their territory all through the house. That is, in a way, what it is like to be a human being. Oh, I've got control. I'll take care of this. Perfect. And as quickly as we celebrate, revel in our victory, it's undone. Because we are actually far more helpless than we want to admit. So death and helplessness. One smaller question, is there any benefit of fear? Is fear ever helpful? And yes, I've touched on this. There can be it's helpful because it warns us. It says, change your direction or make new plans or don't go there or don't be with that person or don't invest in that. You get that gut feeling. I don't feel right about this. I feel nervous about this. And sometimes it's the fear that leads us to making a good decision, something that's good for us. It can be a warning system. but that benefit quickly can be lost because fear goes from a signal that helps us stay free to a prism that puts us in shackles. And so then we have anxiety. We become obsessively compulsive about control. We, be, we, we develop phobias. These are all prisons that steal our life in the name of preserving it. They lied to us. They didn't love us after all. So there is a very quick uh, overview of the what, why, and how of fear by a non-psychologist, all pointing to the broad conclusion that fear is basic to human existence. But as Christians, we can also conclude that the Bible teaches that fear can be resolved. That's where we're going to head now, is how do we resolve it? And ultimately, and this is a really great thing to chew on, so if you don't hear anything else, catch this point. The way that we resolve fear is ultimately to wrestle with what our deepest allegiance is. Uh, faith, more often than it is, should be described as allegiance to God. It actually has that connotation in the Greek. And we could say that fear is really a faith issue, but I like the word allegiance in this a little bit better. It's an allegiance issue. And here's why. You see, as Christians, we're not simply trying to understand fear. Uh, any reputable psychologist can help you with that. Pick up People magazine, you'll get a good definition of fear. And furthermore, being afraid isn't necessarily a sin, but it can become a sin. And it can lead to disobedience, and it can lead to selfishness, and it can lead to mistreatment of others. It can cause us to fail to be generous. It can cause us to fail to tithe to the Lord. It can cause us to help uh, to choose to not be helpful to other people because our time is so valuable to us. All areas where we fear losing something, therefore our behavior actually becomes sinful. Uh, fear got, causes us to say to God, I can't do that. Or I won't do that. I can't go there. Or God, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to end that relationship. I won't give that much. I can't help like that. And I will not commit to that place for that season. And so all those expressions of no thank you, God, 
They're not just bad manners. Those are statements of allegiance to something else. And these are actions and attitudes then that can offend God because they indicate that our allegiance is ultimately not to him, but to someone or something else above him. And those moments of wrong allegiance are not just isolated choices. Allegiance to people and things that are not God is actually, and this is really quite fascinating, at least for me, it is deeply connected to the fear of death. So remember Hebrews 2, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So the writer of Hebrews here points to the power of death that is held by the devil, which holds people in slavery by the fear of death. Richard Beck uh, talks about it like this. He says, the power of death that the devil wields is characterized here as a slavery to the fear of death. It is not death per se that gives the devil power. It is rather the fear of death. And so here's, here's the interesting thing about this. It actually is the fear of death that leads to sin, which is a little bit different than the way that we usually think about sin. So if you're a good evangelical, there's a good chance you've wrote, uh, memorized Romans 6.23, which tells us that the wages of sin is death. And that's true. The wages of sin is death. What we don't talk about very often, but this is actually the main uh, uh, theological understanding of sin and death in the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, comes out of 1 Corinthians 15.56, where Paul says that the sting of death is sin. And so we have two orderings. We have sin, therefore death. And here we actually have death, therefore sin. So how this works is if I feel afraid of losing something, death in some form, and I feel responsible to preserve my own self-interest, I will do all sorts of things that ultimately give allegiance to something other than God and his will. If I am scared enough, I will justify all sorts of sinful things because I had no choice. And I don't think that many Christians, or for that matter, anyone, is thinking about the fear of death as a fuel for sin. We only think about death as a result of it. But is it our fear of death, and I think it is, that so often causes us to give allegiance to something else. And so how do we remedy that then? If we live in a world where we are uh, fighting an enemy whose power is to make us afraid of death in all its forms, how do we remedy that? So we're going to look at Luke chapter 22. And this is Jesus wrestling with fear. You know, we fight fire with fire. We fight fear with fear. Luke 22, 39 to 40. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. I just want to pause here because I don't have this in my notes, but I think that this is important because it gives context. Pray that you will not fall into temptation because Jesus actually knows that he in this moment is actually wrestling with the tension of allegiance. And so he is going to go model what it looks like to pray through temptation to not follow through. And he's teaching them to do the same. And so he withdraws about a, a stone's throw beyond them and he knelt down and prayed and he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. So it never ceases to amaze me the power of language to communicate such enormous truth in so few words. I mean, what is going on in this sentence is transcendent and cosmic and eternal, and we capture it in like 12 words. On the night of Jesus' arrest, Jesus, along with these disciples, head out to the Mount of Olives, 
to spend some time in prayer. Right there, we have a clue as to what do we do when we're afraid. We take it to God. And I'm not going to make a whole point of this, but it is worth saying, if we want to prevent our fear from offending God, a good first step is to take our fear to God. Right? And that's what Jesus does. And he, Jesus knows what's coming. He knows what's about to happen to him. He knows that in his greatest hour of need, specifically his greatest hour of fear, that he's got to go to prayer. And in verse 41 and 42, then Luke lets us in to kind of what Jesus is getting in this prayer time. So the first thing that we can take for ourselves is that bringing our fear to God brings us clarity about some things. He withdrew a stone's throw beyond the disciples and he knelt down and he prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Jesus knows that the cross is the apex of his earthly ministry. And Jesus has been talking about his death and he's been talking about his resurrection. And even though he'd been pre preparing his followers for it, even though he had been anointed for his death, even though he'd come into town, Harold is a king for the sake of dying. Jesus is still terrified. And I think we understand this, right? Like sometimes knowing what difficult thing is just down the road is a far worse experience than just being surprised with something scary. Because at least we weren't thinking about it and ruminating on it for days and weeks and months before, right? Jesus has known this is coming. And now he's there. And so in verse 41, he, he records, Luke records that Jesus kneels on the ground and he prays. And this prayer posture was not normal at this time. To us, this seems very normal. Oh yeah, he knelt in prayer. It's like every good Catholic painting of a child in prayer on their knees. This was not the normal posture of prayer at this time. The normal custom of prayer at the time of Jesus was to pray standing up with your eyes to heaven. And yet in this moment, Jesus hits the ground. The fear is so severe that Jesus kneels, which shows us the weight of the fear. This was not an occasion for Jesus to stand up with his eyes to heaven. Jesus was brought low, knees on the dirt, because the fear upon him was that heavy. Fear actually changed the posture of Jesus' prayer. And then it begins to bring clarity to his mind. And the clarity comes around this cup that Jesus has to drink from. While kneeling in prayer, Jesus asks God, if there is any way, take the cup away from me. Cup. Jesus is talking about, when he says cup, his suffering and the wrath of God upon him. Cup is a metaphor specifically for his suffering. It's not a metaphor for physical death in general. Like we don't all go, well, I'm, I'm just awaiting that time when, you know, my grandmother is going to drink of the cup. It's not a metaphor for death. It is a metaphor for Jesus' unique death. And so Jesus isn't just praying through death the way that we might. He's praying through the fear of the type of death that he's about to experience. Jesus is aware that being crucified would be humiliatingly torturous. That's not going to be very fun. True, but that's not even his biggest fear. You know, and so often on Good Friday and Easter, we talk about like, oh, Jesus knew they'd put nails in his hands and whip his back and put a crown of thorns on him and it'd be humiliating and he'd be in his underwear and he'd be nailed to the cross as a criminal. And that's terrible. And that is true. And yet all of that was not his biggest fear. Jesus' biggest fear was that he would face the wrath of God covered in the sin of the world. That's what he is ultimately going, oh my God. Jesus' greatest fear was that he would know for a moment something hopefully none of us will ever know. The separation from God's presence for a time. And he's going, oh my God. This is what Jesus fears. And so he prays, if possible, take that cup away from me. That's a big ask. That's a big ask. Maybe there's another way here, God. Maybe there's another way. But praying through this moment then starts to bring clarity to Jesus' mind. 
as he faces this horrible, scary moment. You see, if Jesus had just let the fear run its course without prayer, without talking to God about it, it would have distorted the perception of God's wisdom, plan, and ability. And yet that's not what happened. In prayer, Jesus gets clarity that God is strong still, loving still, involved still, able still, and good. And if you've ever been afraid of something, and you were really bothered, and it kept you up at night. And then the situation resolved, and you went, ah, oh, I shouldn't have been that upset about that. That actually wasn't hard at all. That wasn't a big deal at all. We know fear changes our perceptions. The cry of the soul puts it like this. Fear distorts our perception of ourselves so that we seem weaker than we really are. It distorts the size of our problems so that they seem huge and undefeatable. But perhaps most significantly, fear distorts our picture of God. God seems weak, uninvolved, uncaring during our troubles. After all, we think if he were strong and concerned, he wouldn't leave me in this situation. Or he wouldn't have allowed this to happen to me at all. If fear is big enough, it will distort our perception in such a way that we will change our allegiance and as a result offend God. And if that's true, then we want to engage these fears in such a way as to receive clarity. Help my perception here, God, so that I ultimately stay faithful to you, that my allegiance would be to you, that I would glorify you with my whole life. You know, if we will prayerfully ponder the question, does this fear drive me to take care of myself? Or does this fear drive me to God as my protector and provider? If we will really wrestle with that, by the Holy Spirit's grace and ministry in our lives, I am certain we will move to clarity about our temptation to go our own way and fresh clarity about who God is what he might be asking us to do, and why he is trustworthy. Next, and this is actually our final point this morning, just two big ones. Bringing our fear to God then leads to wisdom. So Jesus says, yet not my will, but yours be done. And This great verse from Proverbs chapter 9, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So even though Jesus is afraid, he is convinced that his own will is not the consideration in this hour. It is God's will alone that Jesus is submitted to and interested in. And the reason that Jesus holds this deep conviction, this is so important, is because he has a greater fear of God than he has of anything in heaven, hell, or earth. Jesus knows that there is nothing in all the universe, in all history, in all of the future that should produce more fear in anyone than God himself. And so Jesus kneels in prayer and he says, oh, but not my will, yours. Because I am not going to take you on. Perfect submission, perfect allegiance in the midst of fear, and dare I say even because of the right fear. Which really is the key. Because perfect submission comes because the fear of God was greater than the fear of the world. Jesus didn't just know about God. Jesus took what he knew and then in that moment of clarity, reminding his soul of God's will, he applies it. And, he's, and, he, and he knows that God is full of power. He's full of holiness. He's full of justice. He's full of authority. His judgments are perfect, and his future is secure. And that fear causes Jesus to live out perfect obedience, to live out a fear that did not offend God but glorifies God. And the instruction for us is if we will actually bring our fear to God and engage him with it, what we will find is that there is nothing we should fear more than him. Proverbs says that's the starting point of wisdom. 
kind of the, the poor man's definition of wisdom is just knowledge applied. It's taking what you know and actually living it out in such a way that it's not just theory, but it becomes practice. And if we fear God more than anything else, then there is nothing more deserving of all our faith, all our trust, all our allegiance than God the Father. He's the only one, think about this, worthy of all of our fear. Now, I just want to say something about a common understanding, I think, that floats around evangelical churches on the fear of the Lord. Fear of God, especially amongst us sentimental evangelicals, is often reduced to just respect or awe. And I think we do this because somewhere along the lines, we got a little bit sentimental and decided that, well, of course God wouldn't want us to be afraid of him. He's loving and he's fun. He's daddy. And to some extent, that's true. Like, God's not a monster, and I'm not going to suggest to you otherwise. But let's just imagine this for a moment. If we were to behold God in a full disclosure of his holiness, and his splendor, and his authority, and his wisdom, and his grandness, and his power, I suspect I feel afraid. I suspect I fall to my knees and go, oh, God, I thought I knew. I doubt I stand there and say, wow, God, respect, man. You're impressive. Or like, wow, God, you're awe-inspiring. Take his picture the way I would of the Grand Canyon. Of course, we're not afraid of God in the sense that he's out to get us. It's not the monster under our bed, but I do believe fully that a serious lack of the fear of God amongst his church has led, in part, to a lot of room and a lot of opportunity to fear just about everything else. <laughs> and therefore, a very fearful, anxious, worried church amongst a very fearful, worried culture. You know, there's a lot of theories today about why do we have this anxiety epidemic. What I haven't heard many people suggest is that it's at least in part due to secularism, atheism, and agnosticism, all the isms which have rejected God and sought to remove him from society. You see, if we take God out of our banks and our governments and our schools and our courthouses and our national identity, then what we need to do is find something else to be afraid of. So for the last decade or so, people have been finding all kinds of new fears, all kinds of new anxieties. It's been like watching people stake claims on the new frontier. It's like, well, we can be anxiety, anxious as an identity now. Well, I'll be afraid of this, and I'll be afraid of that. If you can touch it, be afraid of it. Years ago, it was one nation under God. It was in God we trust. It was God keep our land glorious and keep it free. And even if people didn't totally get it, and we had these poor theology cowboy prayers you know, stapled to our walls, well, give me a hot meal and a loving wife or whatever. There was still... <laughs> there, was, there was still a sense that God was the ultimate authority. That, that, that for all of America's failure, there at least used to be this, God is our judge. And to Him we are accountable. And it was good for the majority of society to have a healthy fear of God because there was less fear of other things. Today we've removed God from society and then we wonder why we struggle with being chronically afraid of everything else. Alender and Longman put it like this, when we disorient ourselves by being less afraid of God than something else, we get into trouble. When we fear something else, we forget about fearing God. And this is what happened to the Israelites who lived during the time of Isaiah so that God had to confront them saying, and look at this question. Whom have you so dreaded and feared that you've been false to me? Whom have you so dreaded and feared that you've been false to me? And have neither remembered me nor pondered this in your hearts? Is it not because I've long been silent that you do not fear me? What a question. What God asks Israel, what 
we would all do well to ask over and over and over again, what have I so dreaded and feared that I have failed to be true to you? They go on to say that fear of God strips away all other fears. And it compels us to deal with God, transcendent and infinitely higher than any mortal fear. Fear of God roots us not in our problems, but in the essence of existence. <laughs> Wisdom is found in fearing the right thing first, which is God. And unless we come to do as Jesus showed us, to fear God more than the world, to have such a healthy fear of God that His will in every area of our life is our priority over everything else. We will live to slaves of fear, as slaves of fear. And we will live out that feeling of being slaves to fear in ways that get us into trouble and in ways that offend God. And so the ultimate remedy for fear, the ultimate remedy for fear, and believe me, the world peddles a lot of solutions. The ultimate remedy for fear is the fear of the Lord. That is the starting point of wisdom. Sermon in a sentence. Fear is an allegiance issue. It's about who or what we fear most. Bringing our fears to God in prayer leads to clarity and wisdom, enabling us to fear Him above all else and live within that freedom. When fear does not begin with God but the world, we will look for answers, solutions, and comforts in our own imagination, in our own knowledge, and in our own means. And yet Jesus has given us access, uninhibited access, to the one holy God. And for every time that we fear something else first, we have an opportunity to come back to God in clarity and to find wisdom. Forward, not necessarily fearless, but with a fear that works as a tool to produce liberty and actually remove strain. To show us that perfect love really does cast out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. That punishment has already taken place because of the fear of God. So dear church, fear not. 